<laughs> Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Lau. Uh, some of you know me online as the Cosmobiologist. Um, and this show is brought to you by NASA Astrobiology Program and SeganNet. Um, I have an awesome guest for the show today, so I'm kind of giddy, super excited. But before we get to our guest, we have to do our background quiz. Uh, as those of you who are consistent audience members know, every month we have a photo behind our host, uh, and we give you a chance then on Twitter before the next episode to give us a guess at what that is and maybe win some prizes. So for instance, our third place winners, they win some of these really cool NASA stickers. And our second place winners win NASA stickers plus the Astrobiology Graphic Histories. And then our first place winners, they win both of those as well as a glass, a drinking glass from SeganNet. This month's winners, uh, from all the right responses we had on Twitter yesterday, are in third place, Arif Aslam. In second place, Cloudy. And in first place, Tardy Grotto, which is an incredible name. I do have to say, uh, Arif, our third place winner, you got the right location. It is Jezero Crater on Mars, the next landing site. Uh, for Mars 2020 for our next big rover. Uh, however, there is no instrument called the Astrological Telescope. Uh, we do astronomy, uh, and the instrument was CRISM uh, and the context camera on board of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, showing that beautiful area around the next place we're landing a really big rover on Mars. Uh, so thank you very much for that, uh, for competing in our background quiz for this month. The picture behind me will be the background quiz for next month. So if you have an idea of what it is now, that's great. But just wait until we announce uh, the day before our next episode when we have the background quiz. And you can then answer and try to win some of these awesome prizes uh, from NASA Astrobiology and from SaganNet. So without too much further ado, I'd love to get into today's conversation with our guest. Today we're speaking with Dr. Jill Tarter. Uh, many of you know her for all of her years in doing research with the SETI Institute, uh, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. She's been a huge proponent of speaking about the importance of asking that big question of are we alone? And many of you also know that she was the basis for the character of Ellie Arroway in Carl Sagan's novel Contact, which was made into a film back in the 90s starring Jodie Foster. Uh, so Jill Tarter, thank you so much for being an Ask an Astrobiologist. Thanks for having me. Hopefully we won't have any technical difficulties. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sometimes the connections can be a little weird when we're doing a show like this where we're connecting in from different places in the country and sometimes across the planet. Um, as much as we love technology, it's done great things for us, allowing us to put our ear to the heavens and see if there's neighbors out there. Sometimes we still have some issues. Um, but that's okay. Uh, let's just start chatting. It'd be kind of cool. Um, the first big question I'd love to, to start off with is what got you interested in science and that, that big question of are we alone? Well, it was a really very fortunate accident for me. When I was a graduate student, my first year, I was supported to learn how to program the first desktop computer we ever had. Now, this was the PDP-8 slash S. I always thought the S was for stupid. And it took two of us to put it up on the desk Right, but you could use it. And there was no language. So you had to program in an octal. You had to set all the ones and zeros for the 11 instructions that this machine could do. Um, and years later, I was still a graduate student, and this piece of equipment was surplus. And it was given to Stu Boyer, an x ray astronomer who had a brilliant idea about how we could do SETI while the radio astronomers were using the Hat Creek telescope that was run by UC Berkeley to do their studies. We could just make a copy of the signals being uh, collected by the telescope and analyze them for engineered signals. He hadn't any money. He was looking for ways to do it. Somebody gave him this old computer. He came to me and I thought, oh my gosh, after millennia, of asking priests and philosophers what we should believe about the question, are we alone? Suddenly, there are tools. There's radio telescopes, there's computers. And so scientists and astronomers can get involved to try and find out what's out there rather than accept somebody's belief system. And so I said, I'm in. And that's how it started. And I got hooked, and I've never gotten unhooked. Oh, that's awesome. 
Yeah, I think a lot of us, you know, we have those those ideas when we're young. You know, we look at the stars and, at night and the heavens, and we wonder if we're alone. And it is really cool that we have these tools now. Um, I think a big question a lot of people have uh, is how SETI itself has changed over these last several decades of really, like, how, how, how much better have those tools gotten? Um, and what big things have happened in SETI during your career? Well, um, in terms of ideas, two enormous game changers over my career. One, exoplanets, two, extremophiles. And then in terms of instrumentation, we started out purely as a radio source, a search. Uh, we've added more computing that's gotten better. We built our own telescope so we can look all the time. Um, and then when the technologies became available, we started doing an optical search. Um, and so our current instrumentation threshold, I would say now, is to be able to get some sensitivity to transient signals. So we'd love to look at all the sky, all the time, at all wavelengths. That's the next uh, instrumental challenge whose door we're trying to beat down. Okay, that's interesting. So, so right now we're kind of limited to some window of radio a window and optical, but not really looking through the entire EM spectrum yet. Um, but you, you did mention that we now have this, this telescope that allows us to be looking all the time. Um, I imagine you mean the Allen Telescope Array uh, for our audience members to I know do. Um, what we're speaking of there. Um, yeah, so, so now the Allen Telescope Array is, is, to my knowledge, the very first SETI dedicated telescope array. Is that correct? That's right. It's the first time that we've built a telescope on purpose as well as doing radio astronomy. And it's the first time we built a radio telescope as a large number of small dishes, all hooked together with an enormous amount of computing. And that looks like the way in the future to continue to build ever bigger radio telescopes. The square kilometer array in South Africa and Western Australia will be built that way. Um, the next generation, a very large array, will be built um, with smaller dishes and more of them. So this is a good idea, and we've proven that it can be done. That's incredible. That's awesome. Um, yes, I'm, I'm so glad we finally have some dedicated instruments just for SETI, uh, even though we have had other SETI searches on things like the Arecibo radio telescope, um, and also the FAST telescope now being developed in China, to my knowledge, uh, has a mission objective of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, if I can, how do you feel about uh, now other nations uh, also getting interested in SETI and kind of forming their own SETI searches? Hey, bring it on. Absolutely. This is, uh, <laughs> if there's a message out there, it's coming to the planet, right? It's not coming to California or to China or to South Africa. It's coming to the planet, and that information is the property of all humankind. Um, I think that's actually one of the very best things about SETI. As we talk to people about what we're doing and try and get them interested in participating and supporting the work, um, we're actually expanding their perspective. We're making them, um, we're giving them the opportunity to see themselves in a different way, to see themselves as one species, humans on one planet, and SETI kind of holds up a mirror to all of us on this planet and says, see, see, all you guys, you're all the same when compared to something else out there. And so it, op it um, naturally reinforces this cosmic perspective. And I think that's such a very important thing for our long-term survival. We've got lots of challenges on this planet, and those challenges going to respect national boundaries. We are going to have to solve them globally, systemically. And if we get into the mindset of seeing ourselves as Earthlings because of working with SETI, then maybe that's the first step in getting together to work effectively to overcome these challenges. That's interesting, yeah, having more of a, a global view through our cosmic perspective. Um, I love that. 
Um, I do have yeah, to ask, Caleb, so since you Caleb brought up the Schumer files and exoplanets earlier, um, you know, this is Ask an Astrobiologist, and most of our guests on the show previously have done more work in the realm of geochemistry and planetary science. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can speak for our audience, maybe, um, about how SETI itself really fits inside of astrobiology. Well, most people think about astrobiology as looking for in situ biomarkers or remotely for biosignatures. Well, think about it in a parallel way that what we're trying to do is look remotely for techno signatures, looking for evidence of civilizations that modify their environments differently in ways that we might sense over the vast distances to the stars. Sure, we started out with electromagnetic radiation. That's what we knew how to do. We had radio telescopes, we had optical telescopes. Now think about it. We are building or talking about building or wishing to build lots more large glass facilities on the ground and uh, telescopes with lots of different capabilities in orbit. And these are being built in part to look for biosignatures. But what else might they see that would indicate astroengineering, not just astrobiology? Um, and so we've been trying to talk to the community about what might an engineered planet look like? What, how might we tell something um, that is modified as opposed to, to natural out there? Big, large astroengineering project to capture energy might be one thing, mirrors or Dyson spheres. But we also, when and if we get the capability to image these distant exoplanets, we might find that their albedo is strange. Their temperatures are strange, both of which could happen because of life. But if we find that their temperatures, for example, are uniform from pole to equator, maybe that's an indication that somebody is looking to make more habitable real estate to manage weather, um, do something that we can't do, that's for sure, but maybe another technology could. Suppose you look at the TRAPPIST-1 system, right? Those seven planets all closely orbiting a red dwarf star. Uh, and when we get the ability to image them, we find out that they're all the same, right? They should be different temperatures because of their different distances from their host. But what if we find that they're all the same? Again, maybe somebody needed some more habitable real estate and decided to um, engineer some of those planets. So it's this kind of thing, thinking broadly, techno signatures as well as biosignatures. Hmm, interesting. That makes me think a lot about David Grinspoon's uh, recent book, Earth in Human Hands and how he discussed that the future of humanity might be coming to the point of actually geoengineering our planet to, for instance, control our own climate, our own temperature. Uh, so I find right. it very interesting that, that we, we might look for other civilizations who've gotten that point already in controlling their own worlds. Well, you know, Arthur Clarke gave us three laws, right? The third of which was any sufficiently advanced technology would be distinguishable from magic, right? And we've sort of been using that as a backdrop of our thinking. But more recently, uh, a philosopher by the name of Carl Schroeder has suggested that any sufficiently advanced technology would be indistinguishable from nature. That is, that sustainability would require a technological civilization to become extraordinarily efficient and not put their planet out of kilter. So scratching our heads about that one and thinking, what would that imply in terms of interpreting the data that we're going to get back from these future missions? Mm, interesting. 
Yeah, so kind of in, in that vein, I, I have a question I want to ask. Uh, you were on um, an interview with Science Friday a couple of years ago, and I heard a statement that you said that the 21st century will be the century of life on Earth and beyond. Um, I wonder if you could speak more to what that really means for our audience, that this century might be the century for life. Well, this is taking off from a quote uh, by Carl Venter and Daniel Cohen in 2004. They wrote a paper that said, whereas the 20th century had been the century of physics, 21st century was going to be the century of biology. And that was a real bold prediction. And they were talking about genomics and proteomics and uh, bioengineering and all of this wonderful stuff, which is, in fact, uh, paying off much quicker than they might have uh, anticipated. But I think as bold as that was, not really bold enough. I think that this is going to be the century of biology, not just on Earth, but beyond. Because I think there are a number of ways that we can detect biology this coming century. Um, we can find it with the, the missions that are being um, proposed to look for microbial life, to look for the chemical signatures of life in the atmospheres of exoplanets. Uh, we might find evidence for extinct or even extant life on some of the bodies within our own solar system as we get the opportunity to explore those robotically or in partnership with, with humans. Um, and we might, in fact, as we're looking for something else, stumble across uh, evidence of huge astroengineering. And lastly, we might take it there, right? We might, by going to the moon and to asteroids and to Mars, we, in fact, might be responsible off this planet. So I think this next century is going to be incredibly exciting right and That's i awesome. you know i wish i could plan to stick around to the end of it to see how it all works out yeah no kidding <laughs> that's wonderful um yeah it's kind of interesting just to think about what's coming right now um for all of us in astrobiology there's so many things like you mentioned we have spacecraft studying our solar system we have telescopes on earth and in and, and orbit studying exoplanets and, and we also have seti um i i wonder uh, if you could, for our audience, tell us what you we think hope we right now is the most important thing, not just for SETI right now, but for the future of SETI as well. You know, I missed the end of your question. You said not just for SETI right now, but... Uh, but for the future of SETI as well. Okay. Well, the answer to that question is pretty simple. It's a, a sustainable funding profile, right? SETI's funding has been a roller coaster historically, and we need to put it on a stable platform. We need to find a way to fund projects that have a very long horizon potentially before they pay off. The um, high energy physics community and the gravitational wave community have been able to do that putting funding year after year after year into building instruments that weren't good enough when they were turned on and got made better. We need to find a model for that, hopefully at a lower price tag than building LIGO or the, the uh, Large Hadron Collider, but a model where because we have some sort of dependable funding base, we can in fact attract the best and the brightest. You know, lots of people are excited about this field, but if you tell them, oh, this and the other thing, but maybe I can't pay you next month. Hmm, that's a little bit close to home right now. Uh, but seriously, uh, having a funding base will allow us to, to take on very large projects that, Im that provide us with huge improvements in our capabilities and will allow young people with great ideas to uh, become part of this exploration. Awesome, yeah. And I think we have some of those best and brightest watching our show right now. So, you know, if you're out there, um, you know, these are things you can do now. Um, 
So before we do open it up to questions from the audience, um, I do have a couple of fun things I want to bring up. Um, for one, uh, David Grinspoon uh, had posted on Twitter last year some pictures of you fixing a model of the Green Bank Telescope um, at the SETI Institute. Yes. I wonder if you could explain, since we're going to show the picture right now for our audience, uh, if you could explain what's happening in that picture. Well, the Green Bank Telescope is uh, a wonderful example of an offset Gregorian design, which means the telescope feed doesn't come up into the, from the middle of the telescope. It actually hangs off from one side. And now you can decide, if you've got a telescope, to hang your feed up high or hang it off the bottom down low. And the Allen Telescope Array has a feed low configuration, but the GBT has a feed high configuration. And we have this beautiful model at the SETI Institute that with moving around and changing offices, et cetera, had gotten broken. And its, its broken position had it lying down with its feed on the ground. And so now that it has become um, a viable SETI instrument being used by the Breakthrough Listen project, I really felt that we needed to have it presented correctly. So I was early for a science advisory board meeting one morning and I got out the super glue and the, the scissors and the tools and I fixed it so that the feed is now up where it should be. I, I felt that. very that's good great. That. Yeah, it's perfect. I mean, that's kind of what scientists do. We see things, you know, that need to be fixed. I mean, they're kind of messed up like that. Engineers do that, you know, they, they see things that aren't exactly the way that they are in nature. We, we, we question why. And I love that. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up uh, contact uh, and what it was like having Carl Sagan um, and Andruin uh, tell you that you were the basis in some ways for this character of Ellie Arroway. Um, can you tell us what that was like um, when you found out that you were somewhat being immortalized in a work by Carl Sagan? Well, it was a long time ago. It was in mid the mid 80s. Uh, Carl was a colleague. And I actually happened to be back at Cornell for a meeting and Carl said, come on up to the house, we're having a cocktail party. So I dutifully went up to their beautiful house in the, in the hills and um, they took me aside, Anne and Carl, and they said, um, Carl's writing a science fiction book. And I said, oh, come on. The New York Times last weekend told us what kind of an advance he got and we're so bloody jealous, right? And they said, well, you may think you recognize someone in the book, but I think you're going to like her. And so I said, oh, my goodness. Look, just, just make sure that she doesn't eat ice cream cones for lunch. Because that was something that I got teased about relentlessly. That was my daily lunch to walk from our laboratories over to the Baskins and Robbins on the base and get ice cream cone and walk back, right? So I could have my pleasure and get my steps simultaneously. And I thought, well, as long as that characteristic isn't there, nobody's going to think it's me. Well, it didn't exactly work out that way. And it, I had a great time when this book turned into a movie. Um, it was a real privilege to work with Jodie Foster because she's a brilliant, wonderfully good actor, very kind person. And we had a lot of fun. And actually, I was down at Arecibo when they were filming there. Sadly, I left too early to um, prevent the huge innumeracy that's there. But while I was there, I just was fascinated by all their gear. They've got really good technologies. And I was thinking, hmm, well, maybe I'd like to make movies if I can't make it in, uh, in SETI, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people who are interested in astrobiology, uh, interested in this idea of are we alone, are also huge fans of science fiction. Um, and so things like Contact have inspired us. so many of us. Um, and it'd be kind of cool yeah, to I have that chance science to fiction see. Is, is, I think science fiction is great because it gives us an opportunity to think about things that we can't conceive of. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of my favorite science fiction stories is Fred Hoyle, cosmologist, wrote a story about a plasma cloud that was intelligent and causing us um, unintended 
clocking the sun as it came to visit us. Um, that's a type of intelligence I might not have thought of. But now that I've read that book, there's some little piece of my mind that's open to that idea. Interesting, yeah. It's interesting how, yeah, science fiction kind of gives us a way of seeing ourselves in settings in different time periods. Um, I do have to ask, if, if, if Carl Sagan was here right now and was writing the novel Contact right now, or, or if the film Contact were being made right now, um, how do you think it would be different from the way it was, was made back in 1985 when the novel was first published? Well, Carl was prophetic, unfortunately, in terms of understanding that whereas we were a government program and fat, dumb, and happy in some sense, uh, we would face uh, termination of the funds and then be struck with the difficulty of going out and raising money. I wish he hadn't been right about that piece. Um, I think that uh, what would be different now would be a larger concentration on private funding being sufficient or at least maybe just adequate to take on the challenges of spaceflight. So I think he would be having a lot to say about SpaceX and Blue Origin and um, uh, all of the other opportunities for access to space that aren't directly related to the federal government. Of course, they're funded in the end by federal funds, by these contracts that uh, the uh, private companies get from the government. But still, it's a different way of doing it. And I think Carl would be fascinated by to see where that was going. Yeah. yeah, things have changed a lot. I mean, for the generation coming up right now, you know, for them, we've always had people in space, in orbit, and we live in a time where we have private companies developing rockets, and we have, you know, Breakthrough and SETI, and these different companies, these organizations kind of, you know, taking on some of these tasks themselves. Um, but I think it is a good time now to, to change up the conversation and, and open up some questions from the audience, um, if we can. Um, so on this idea uh, of science fiction, um, Michael Wong, writing on Twitter, has asked uh, that he'd love to hear your thoughts on the 2016 science fiction film Arrival, um, if you saw that. I saw it and I loved it. I just, I was, I keep trying to wrap my head around the fact that if you're going to write in circles, you have to know the future. And I think that's such a mind exploding concept. I thought that was, that was beautiful. And I thought the actors and the, it was all great. I really liked it. Yeah, me too. Uh, it, it seems like SETI and, and people, you know, who are really thinking about SETI deeply are also people who are considering what language would be like if it were different from the way that we use language. And so it kind of makes sense, you know, the question, what happens if we write circularly? Um, are there people actively working with SETI who are linguists, who are trying to figure out how an alien language might actually look? There are. There. This has been um, a topic of interest for quite a while. And at first, I think the easy solution to that was, well, it'll be based on mathematics, right? And certainly um, Freudenthal developed this whole language called Linkos that was supposed to allow uh, communication of complex emotional uh, concepts, but starting with very, uh, very precise rules, sort of mathematical rules. But then if you learned more about the brain, it seems to us now that the actual structure of our brain uh, dictates how we think about mathematics, perhaps. So we might be correct that something like um, the periodic table or simple rules of addition, subtraction, and that sort of thing, that they're all correct. But even to technological civilizations, trying to describe the same phenomenon using their intrinsic math, it might not look 
anything like the same thing. So we're getting a bit, we're, we're going beyond the back of the envelope in our thinking here, trying to understand what, if anything, is universal, what is fundamental, and what is contingent upon the fact that we have a three pound brain that is structured the way it is. All right, that, that leads really well into our next question then uh, from Dr. Jim Pass from Twitter. Uh, Jim uh, runs the uh, Astro Sociolo Sociology Research Institute, um, and he's really interested in how social science, linguistics, uh, how these Oops. other parts of the humanities and those studies. Can't hear you. Oh, I apologize. Um, the next question comes from Twitter, from Jim Pass. Um, he wants to know how social scientists and humanists uh, they're often overlooked sometimes in astrobiology. Uh, he wants to know what the future collaborations could be with the social sciences and things like astrobiology and SETI. He's right in the fact that in the past they haven't been included or not well included. To get smarter and so now we are looking for opportunities to work with these other disciplines. Um, it's difficult. it's difficult. We all have our own methodologies, and it's more than just writing an astrobiology primer with a glossary to explain to a geologist what a chemist means. There's some more difference in the way that some of the social scientists and some of the um, SETI scientists approach the same question. But nevertheless, we realize that there's a great deal of value. For there's a terrible book decades ago called Chariots of the Gods, which was totally disrespectful to civilizations from uh, millennia ago because he said, oh, you couldn't have done this or built this or uh, created this unless there was some super intelligence that came down from a spaceship and guided you to do it. Well, totally, totally disrespectful to those civilizations. And as a very, very first step, it really makes sense to go back with folks that are trained in digging into the past of different uh, ethnic and cultural groups and seeing, are there any anomalies buried deep in history that might in fact turn out to be techno signatures? Who knows? I mean, it, unfortunately the whole thing has a, has, has a bad taste because of how poorly it was done with Chariots of the God, but it is a project that could be well done by cooperating with experts in those fields. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think myself and others have written about Erich van Daniken and Chariots of the Gods and the issues with, you know, the, the inherent racism and culturalism involved in that. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we have another question, and this one kind of often comes to lots of us in the realm of astrobiology and, and even space science in general when people say, you know, why go spend money on going to space when we have these problems here? Uh, our next question comes from Marianne Denton on Twitter. Uh, she says, when I speak with others about exploration or astrobiology, there's always somebody who wants to know what the return on the investment is. Uh, so her question is, how can I best share that this is a valid pursuit? And, and I assume by this she means, uh, how is SETI a valid pursuit? Okay, I've got a really simple answer for her, which is, that SETI may turn out to be um, absolutely critical to humans and life on Earth having a long future. Um, it's a statistical answer, so sometimes it does not please questioners, but here's the deal. If there are any two technological civilizations that are capable of contacting one another, and we succeed in that contact. It means that that other civilization has to be close by. And that's close in space, so that we are sensitive enough to detect them, but also close in time. 
we have to be overlapping in this 10 billion year history of our galaxy. And if technological civilizations, as a rule, um, start up, grow up, expand, then either turn themselves off or do themselves in, in time scales that we can measure in human times, there will never be a successful contact. But turn that around. If we succeed with SETI, we know that on average, technological civilizations must be long lived. Somebody else has figured out how to do it, how to have a sustainable technological civilization for millennia, for hundreds of thousands, millions of years. Something that we don't necessarily see as a possibility for us today. We see lots of ways it could go wrong. But, you know, even a cosmic dial tone, no information, but just proof of existence tells us that we can have a long future. And I think it would be hugely motivational for us to try and get our act together and figure out how to get there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it seems like, you know, even though right now, I think so many of us, we, we tend to focus so much on the bad things sometimes going on around the world. We see war and we see poverty and we see a lot of these problems caused by climate change and caused by governments not functioning or not working together. Um, but some of us also see a lot of promise in how people from different backgrounds, different genders, uh, different ideas are starting to work together more. Uh, and in, in many ways, astrobiology, SETI, and the sciences and engineering in general are opening up to so many more people right now on the globe, uh, which kind of leads to our next question then. Yeah, uh, it's that cosmic perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this one comes from T uh, Tarta Grelda on Twitter. Uh, she wants to know then from you, uh, what's the best advice you can give to girls uh, who want to dive into any field of astrobiology right now? Find out what you really love to do, and then learn how to use some tools and become better at using those tools than anybody else. Because then with this tool set, you can go look around for projects that might yield to your skills, and you can essentially um, drive your own boat, right? So have skills, so will travel, travel, let's find let's the find interesting, interesting problems, problems, and you won't be you able won't to solve them without me. So, so I want on board, board and you'll, you'll, you'll turn out to be out much better served, better served by including, by including me. me. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, that, that applies to so many people uh, who want to get involved in these things as well. Um, I do remind our audience, uh, you can always tweet your question using, using hashtag AskAstroBio on Twitter. Uh, you can also ask questions on Facebook and on Saganet. Um, so our next question actually comes from Facebook now, uh, from Tom Caruso. Uh, Tom wants to know, um, he says, can you please tell us what you think about listening for life deep in remote ocean worlds, um, possibly using like seismometers and hydrophones? Um, so kind of like doing SETI, but looking downwards inside of worlds. Right. So we use those deep hydrophones to study uh, humpback whales, to try and understand their social engineering as they recruit members to um, cooperate in bubble netting, members who aren't relatives, as it turns out. Um, that's the technology we're beginning to understand. We also know that when you're trying to figure this all out, it helps as if, if you have video as well as the audio so that you can see their actions and tie them to the audio sounds that you're recording. That's going to be a challenge for off-world. Um, what size creature uh, gets to vocalize at depth in water? Probably microbes aren't really very chatty at least in terms of oral kinds of communication 
large structures like the humpback who understand the structure of the ocean and can go and find the the level in the thermocline that will allow their songs and their messages to travel the longest distance such very large creatures um, are well suited to that kind of communication in a in a liquid world um, I don't know I'm I'm very very eager to see how we solve the problem of sampling the ocean worlds within our own solar system um, what can we do with plumes and how can we concentrate what it is that we collect and how can we avoid contamination of the uh, material that we are trying to collect as we if we have to melt through or drill through kilometers of ice to get there. All fascinating questions. Thought. Um, if you're really going to tie it to intelligent communication, I think you're gonna need some visual cues as well. Some strange ramification of um, um, vents creaking and stretching and and contorting mm, interesting yeah um, since, since you brought up the, this idea of contamination um, I do wonder what you think of planetary protection um, right now when we launch missions through NASA um, we have a planetary protection officer their job is, is to try to make sure that we're being as clean as possible and launching our spacecraft we're also weary of bringing potential alien life back to Earth. Um, what do you think about planetary protection um, and then including that in our mission designs? Okay, Graham, I lost yep. all of that after what do I think about planetary protection and I vote for it. Yes, I think we <laughs> okay. extremely thoughtful about how we do our research. We're only gonna get in most cases, one chance. And it would be really disappointing if we didn't do our exploration in the most appropriate way so that we don't end up with ambiguous results. Okay, awesome. Um, our next question comes from the user JC on Twitter. Uh, JC says, if life developed on a planet orbiting a star with a different luminosity than our sun, do you think photosynth uh, photosynthesis that may evolve there will still reflect primarily green light, or would we see a change um, in what they're using, taking advantage of the most abundant wavelengths of light? Yeah, you mentioned something earlier, which leads me to believe, I think the fact that we do this, the fact that astrobiology is a young science, and wasn't a science that was all stove piped and stuffed up with, excuse me, old white males, um, has opened up the field to young scientists of all persuasions and globally, right? I think it's great. I think this is just the way we need to go. So if you'll allow me to give your audience a homework assignment. Oh, please. Um, I would I like would to like challenge them to go to all of their social media devices, each of which has a profile, and suggest to them that they might want to say in that profile, the very first thing they say about themselves is that they're an earthling. Because I think ultimately that's what's going to matter. We're going to find a sustainable future for ourselves and, and the rest of life on this planet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's interesting, I mean, you mentioned, you know, how we are connecting with all these people. And there are so many awesome audience members uh, of our show from around the globe, from Turkey and the UK and India and Egypt uh, and other nations who are tuning in because there are so many young people now across the globe who want to get involved in astrobiology. I speak with young women and young men from various countries, from various backgrounds on a weekly basis these days. Um, about what they can do to get involved in astrobiology. And so I think so many of us are humbled to see how 
enthusiastic all these young people are from all these different backgrounds about these big questions of, of are we alone? Um, and if not, how do we find out? And I absolutely love that. Um, right. And, you know, because because we're now engaging globally with different cultures and different traditions, um, as well as we're being more inclusive as far as gender is concerned, I think that it's inevitable that we're going to stub our toes, right? That we're going to make mistakes. I'll, not not intentionally, not with bad will, but just out of ignorance or not understanding. And I think that we all have to be prepared for that and be willing to say, uh, hey, whoops, that wasn't appropriate. And then we all move on and get over it. And it's only bad if you don't learn from that and repeat the action. And then we should think, appropriate uh, uh, controls or, or, or reactions. But yeah, but yeah people are going to make mistakes. mistakes. Be aware of it. Try and um, and move on. But if they repeat, nope. So yeah, so kind of on that idea of, of us making mistakes, I'm going to bring it back around to science fiction for a moment. Um, our user Suraj Kumar Sahu on SaganNet uh, wants to know what you think of the film Interstellar, um, a film where it starts off with the idea that humans have made a very bad mistake, have made Earth's climate so unlivable that they want to go somewhere else to live. Um, what do you think about the story in Interstellar? Either they didn't do their calculations correctly or that framers of the movie did not give us enough information to make the case that it was totally unaffordable to fix things at home because the cost of taking a population off planet is really horrendously large. And I think a lot less money would probably used wisely and in a very targeted fashion could probably solve the problems at home. And bottom line, if you don't solve them, you're just going to get them with you. And you're going to be facing the same problem in the future in another location. So I think that um, I'm really, really excited about exploration. And I think humans will be occupying other bodies in the future. I think it won't be all humans. I think it will be the explorers, the scientists, the engineers um, at the frontiers, and that's good. But hopefully they have a well-shepherded planet to come home to. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, so, so the scientists, the engineers will be the next pioneers, basically. Um, yeah. We have another question here from Rami El Sabah from SaganNet. Uh, Rami asks, do you think there's another form of life on another planet where their building blocks are inorganic matter? Um, so perhaps something like the silicon life that some have talked about. You know, that's really one of these, these things that's so hard to puzzle. Are we telling ourselves a just so story when we make the arguments for um, the greater efficiency of carbon versus silicon. Um, you know, with one example, it's damn near impossible to um, decide what's necessary and what's contingent. I often think if I had a prehensile tail, which would be a lot of fun, I think I would have a really good story to tell you about why I couldn't be a scientist why I couldn't be an engineer, why I couldn't try to answer this question if I didn't have that tail. So, yeah, there are lots of stories that we can tell, and it's based in, in the science that we currently understand that says carbon is going to win out over silicon. I mean, if you want to get gross, kind of hard to eliminate sand. I just think about... Phases and 
uh, the seaside and the sand inside my bathing suit, right? Um, so carbon dioxide gas is, is a lot easier to deal with than silicon dioxide. Um, but we just, there's so much we don't know. And with all of these questions, as a physicist, you want to say, okay, here are all the options. And let's figure out what the branching ratios are. You know, how much, what percentage of the time do things go in that direction versus that direction versus that direction? And then we could begin to make uh, reasonable statements about these kinds of very good questions. At the moment, we've just got an example of one, and we have to see what we can do with that. Absolutely. Um, so I have one more question then uh, here from our, our audience. Um, and it kind of follows off of that. So rather than being based in inorganic life, whether or not um, biological life as we know it here on Earth could evolve um, into a form of inorganic life. Uh, so Penny Boston on live stream has asked. <laughs> Hi, Penny. Um, <laughs> she asked, what's your personal opinion as to whether civilizations that we may discover or that may discover us are more likely to still be organic life or that have transitioned to some sort of cyber race? Yeah, I think that, uh, I think I've seen some of Penny's cartoons and I think she's got some very interesting ideas about a future evolution that takes us to be more a cooperative partnership with um, silicon-based intelligence. I mean, some people go the other way and say, once the silicon-based intelligence shows up, we don't really need the biologicals anymore. Maybe we'll make good pets. Um, I, I actually think it's going to be a cooperative co-evolution such as we've had on this planet for billions of years. And we, we ultimately, we probably will not be the smartest kid on the board. Hmm, interesting. So the future might not just be just us, but us sharing our world and our future with, with another thing. <laughs> I like that. Um, well, that's all the time that we had for today's episode. Uh, Jill, thank you so much for joining us for Ask an Astrobiologist. Oh, it's been my pleasure, and I'm sorry we've had these hiccups and technological freezes. And Caleb reminds us that on a finite world, a cosmic perspective is a necessity and not a luxury. So, it's go, Caleb. I think we'll leave it right there. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us, and stay curious. Mm -hmm.